Our next speaker is Sam Jiggins, New South Wales DPI B Biosecurity Officer Surveillance, and he will be talking to us about exotic and endemic pests and diseases of honeybees. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sam Jiggins, B Biosecurity Officer Surveillance, and I'm here today to um, give you a quick chat and quick discussion about my beekeeping background um, and also cover some exotic and endemic pests and diseases throughout um, Australia at the moment. Yeah, I hope you've had a good day so far and there's been some interesting um, presentations and you've enjoyed them all and hopefully I'm not too boring with uh, what I'm about to talk about, not too doom and gloomy. Um, we'll kick it off anyway, I'll give you a little bit of a background of my, um, my line, my experience in bees so far. I started out uh, beekeeping out in the central west of New South Wales from a very young age, around 10 or so with my grandparents. So I'll um, start with um, a little bit of a tribute to those, those legends. Um, Joan and Peter Stone Street out in the central west, New South Wales, they got me into bees from a very young age. Um, image there of my grandfather with a flow hive in his 90s that he was managing. Um, and I would come in and check on it every now and then just to make sure everything's all right. But yeah, these two people got me in the bees and they gave me the bug, so to speak, that everyone talks about. Um, you know, a good friend of mine says beekeeping's not a profession, it's a, it's a disease. Well, I've, I've got the disease because of these guys. So, yeah, thanks very much. But um, I love it, love bees, and I love everything that, that's involved around it. Um, my interest and my thirst for, for knowledge around bees just grew. As I grew older, I'm a diesel mechanic by trade, worked for um, Australian Defence Force as well in the Army. So, um, yeah, I've always had a passion for agriculture and, and you know, bees have always been in the background for a very long time. So I decided I wanted to get a bit more serious about it after working for the local ABA club, um, being a, an apiary manager, and I wanted to get more experience. So I went and did the Cert 3 in beekeeping and out of Tokal under these, these people. Um, Doug Somerville, Danny Lloyd Pritchard, and uh, there's a very young, fresh Elizabeth Frost straight off the boat from California. But um, yeah, we were the first cohort, my wife and I. There's my wife, Bianca, in the background. And um, yeah, interest for the environment grew, watching, watching and monitoring all the eucalypt species and their flowering events. And yeah, it, it just kept escalating and escalating. The disease kept taking over and consuming my life. Um, yeah, Doug was a big advocate and mentor for me, as was many others. Um, the local New South Wales AA branch, Cole Wilson. I've been a member of the New South Wales AA for a good eight years now and uh, eight or nine years and yeah they, they encouraged me to go and get some industry experience so off I went I went and worked for Lockwoods for a while out in the central west the goldfield apiaries there's an image of me out there doing honey production um, also queens for a few queen breeders in the Newcastle region Jamie Bags but yeah there's some nuke boxes there that I was part of um, developing yeah, uh, drove trucks down for Armands. Uh, done some, yeah, that's me at Armands probably probably seven years ago or so. So yeah, I've had a, a, a quite a decent level of experience. This is a little collage of just things, how things just got a little bit out of hand and I just got into it even more. Um, image in the, in the center there is my wife and I in our, our shed we were living in at the time. That's our living room. Uh, building beehive boxes um, with my military background uh, with a dog we trained a dog to successfully um, scent detect AFB in hindsight I probably should have had it successfully uh, detect Varroa but um, yeah no it, it's this is just a, giving you an indication of how things just got um, I've just been totally wrapped up by bees and my passion for, and drive for bees is, is like like nothing else, there's nothing else that gets me out of bed to um, to go and learn and to, to be employed to do bees um, full time is an absolute privilege. So yeah, there's the, um, the image in the top left there is myself doing some instrumental insemination under Casey Cooper and Elizabeth Frost. Um, this is other things, just escalating once more into bees, my commitment. Um, above there is our extraction shed that we built um, very recently. And there's my face looking how chuffed I was. I was pretty excited about be, uh, having a, a, sh a big shed. 
But um, yeah, we spent a fair bit of money. Um, we've escalated to having a truck, and um, yeah, all the other things are involved with bees. So yeah, life in beekeeping was pretty fun, or well, it still is, but, um, and quite peaceful and interesting for me. Um, with very little problems apart from having a uh, an empty wallet from spending all the cash. Any spare penny I have, I spend it on bees, just because um, that's what we do, isn't it? But then, um, yeah, this happened all of a sudden, the 22nd of June, um, the detection of varroa destruction, it just turned up on our, our do front doorstep. Um, that's about a week after it was publicly announced, uh, going and doing some volunteering work in the Newcastle region where I first came face to face with Varroa Destructor and that was very confronting. And um, from there it's, you know, I started doing volunteer work and then went to paid work as a team leader um, within the Varroa Mite Emergency Response. And um, that's what I've been doing for the last 12 months, been actively going out and looking and searching for Varroa. Found a lot of infected premises in the last 12 months. And um, yeah, then I applied for the role uh, under the bee pest uh, surveillance program and that's where I ended up so far. This is where I am as of a week ago. I was um, working for the National Bee Pest Surveillance Program. So the National Bee Pest Surveillance Program is funded by Horde Innovation using research and development levies of the horticultural industries. Um, with the significant co-investment um, from the states and territories in contributions to the Australian Honeybee or from the Australian Honeybee Industry Council, uh, Grain Producers Australia and the Australian Government. The National Bee Pest Surveillance Program is coordinated by Plant Health Australia and delivered by the states and territories and that's where I come into play now, um, delivering the, the port surveillance work and, and training and education um, under the National Bee Pest Surveillance Program for New South Wales. So uh, going through the port of, of Botany, Kembla and eventually Newcastle once we get bees back into Newcastle, the Sentinel Hives and chasing exotic pests and diseases that could be of a threat to the horticulture and honeybee industry. So um, yeah, and my, my role will con involve conducting frog sweeps around the ports and um, actively looking for a, a range of exotic pests and diseases that are still out there. I know we've got a, the portfolio is growing, but um, there's still there's still a lot of other threats that are out there, and that's where my role comes into play. So that's my story so far in bees. But um, so we're actively on the hunt for uh, exotic pests and diseases like the varroa variants. There's, there's I think there's a fair few. Well, there is a fair few of varroa variants there. Um, acute bee paralysis, paralysis virus. Um, yeah, there's a portfolio of them all, all there, of what, what we're looking for, what I'm actively going out to look for. And that we need to encourage the, all the registered beekeepers Australia-wide to be actively looking for as well. So one being um, one of the biggest threats at the moment, I've tried to put it in an order of precedence of what I think would be a priority would be what Dr. Coops would have covered on earlier today, I'm sure, no doubt, and everyone else, uh, tropolalapse mites or trophy mites as uh, Professor Sam Ramsey likes to call them. Um, you might be wondering why has Sam put a varroa mite here? I've just put it there in, in contrast to give you a, a scale or an idea of what a trophy mite or tropolalapse mite would look like in comparison to a varroa. Um, yeah, there's some images there of, of, of um, trophy mites feeding on a larva and um, yeah, they're, they're native to Asia where the honeybee evolved to um, parasitize the, the, the brood of the giant honeybee, so Apis dorsata, which I can touch on very shortly. Um, there are four species of tropolalapse and two of which are known to feed on European honeybees. So not only do they um, parasitize the bees, uh, they're capable of transmitting viruses as well like to form wing virus, um, very similar to the varroa mite. But, um, 
another issue or another potential threat is a tracheal mite that, um, that's an exotic pest. Um, they're microscopic, they're quite, quite small, untrained to the human eye. Tracheal mites, um, they invade the breeding tubes or, or the trachea of the honeybee, and that's, that's why, hence the name of tracheal mite. Um, they can't be seen to the naked eye, and they're less than 0.2 of a millimeter in, in size. So these mites crawl down um, into the trachea and pierce their mouth, mouth, their mouth parts into the lining and draw up the blood or the hemolymph of the, of the honeybee. And um, they can only be confirmed under a microscope and via an expert identifier in, in, a, in the lab. But yeah, uh, the image behind me is a trachea that's been dissected with um, some, some mites inside it. So yeah, that's a close up image on the far, far left. Yeah. Just another thing that we're looking out for. So another, another symptom that you, you may pick up if you did have tracheal mites um, in, in your hive would be this K-wing type symptom where the, the wings are quite splayed out um, and also high levels of colony losses. So that could be an indication to get, get it tested in a lab under a microscope. Now another threat is the Asian hornet. So um, Asian hornets, they're predatory, you know, capturing and killing adult honeybees and brood to feed to their own larvae. Adults are 25 to 35 millimetres in length. And their nests have five to six layers of like a paper um, mache-like material in the image to the center there. Um, it looks like a creamy beige or a brown in color and with a single entrance hole of about 15 millimeters in diameter. But yeah, this image above my head here is quite confronting with the hornet there having a feast on a honeybee. So yeah, that's, that's why they are on the exotic pest list. So yeah, and that's what their nests look like just to give you some indication of what, what we're looking for. So virus loads, yep, both um, varroa mites and tropolalaps mites can be uh, carriers and vectors and other, other bee species, subspecies, um, can be carriers for um, viral loads. And one, one of the worst being deformed wing virus, which hasn't been detected or um, identified in Australia yet. Um, big yet, we've been looking throughout the surveillance work we've been doing and I've seen symptoms uh, similar to this and had them tested for deformed wing and uh, they haven't come up. It was just uh, the fact that Varroa had taken over the hive that, that much that the wings had, hadn't properly developed. Um, but it was very similar symptoms to what we're looking at here. And yeah, um, there's plenty of virus loads that could be viral loads that could be out there. Acute bee paralysis virus is one of them and slow bee paralysis virus. So slow bee paralysis virus is found in throughout Britain, Fiji and Western Samoa. And um, that's where the, the front legs become sort of paralyzed. So I don't know if Dr. Coops has already covered this today or not, but I just thought I'd mention it and, and put it out there just to give you an explanation of what threats are, are there. Uh, the large earth bumblebee is another one. So this is an image that I found when I was working down in Tassie, actually. Um, so it's endemic in throughout Tasmania, the bumblebee. And um, I was just blown away at the size of them. You look at, it fits in the palm of your hand, the size of a golf ball. They're bloody massive, massive bees. But um, yeah, that's from the Tarkine in the northwest of Tassie, um, that image. But yeah, there is potential for resource competition and um, like damage to native flora because of their size when they come in and they hit, hit the, the plant. Um, so hard, but um, yeah, this is a comparison of the abdomens of a, a heap of. Um, let's see if I can move myself across here. Here we go, your beauty. Um, th this is a comparison of the abdomens of some, um, or Apis dorsata, which is the giant um, honeybee on the left here, and then European honeybee abdomen in in the center. And then to the right here is Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee. So I just thought I'd give you an indication. Of, it's, it's a 
the abdomen is one of the, the big indicators to, to be looking out for for e exotic um, bees. But um, yeah, the list goes on. <coughs> Here's a, another image of Dorsata. That's the giant honeybee. So they can carry trop tropolalaps mites and tracheal mites. And um, it, they've been known to show signs of deformed wing virus as well. So that's why it's on our radar to be looking for actively. And there's a few others. Um, the red dwarf honeybee or Ap Apis florea. So um, at the moment, I'll move myself over here. Your beauty. Apis um, florea. There's actually a, they can spread tropolalaps mites as well and, um, and also be carriers for other varroa variants like a U varroa. And currently there is um, detection of Apis florea in Western Australia at this point in time. So it'd be interesting to see what comes of that. Um, they're a much smaller bee. Um, there's a queen there to the right of the left hand image and that's what their, their comb build up looks like. But um, they they swarm quite often as well. But yeah, another another potential threat to industry. So that's what we um, we cover. So there's other um, endemic pests and diseases that we have as well um, that we need to keep an eye out of. Um, I've sort of put this in an order of priority because this has been one of the biggest threats. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the biggest threats to the bee industry um, in New South Wales or East Coast, Australia at the moment, was the small hive beetle and how they take over. This will be an interesting combination with Varroa as we learn to live and manage with Varroa. Um, there's an image there to the left that um, a lot of beekeepers would be very familiar with, which is a slime out. It's the, the larval stage of the, of the small hive beetle. Um, it, as it defecates throughout the hive and eat, eats, eats all the... Um, all the matter throughout the, the hive and can tarnish it. And high, high levels of yeast, they can detect um, a hive that's being over, overwhelmed by a um, small hive beetle. Very, very versatile beetle. It'll be interesting to see what happens um, as Varroa gets established here as well. American fowl brood is another big one. Um, it can spread throughout all bee equipment and movement. It's been a bacterial disease. It's remained viable for over 50 years um, in beekeeping equipment and hiveware and wax and honey products. So it's a notifiable disease um, under the code under, and it needs to be dealt with but with by euthanizing the hive and burning or treating the hiveware with, um, with gamma radiation. That's a rope test there, that image there of a early detection. I've got an image, I believe, of a healthy brood, um, healthy brood to the to the left there, as you can see, and then over to the right, there's a quite a heavy infestation of AFB with sunken cells. Um, I don't know if you can see the quality of the image there. There's, there's a lot of scale on, on the old cells here, but yeah, it, it's a terrible disease for, for honeybees. It's, it's quite endemic. I've been blown away at how much AFB I've found in both recreational and beekeeping uh, commercial enterprises throughout this response that um, I've been involved in. So yeah, it's a big one on my radar that we want to try and educate industry and um, recreational beekeepers alike to, to um, deal with these issues accordingly. So Nazima is another one, Nazima apis. It's like a dysentery uh, in and around the entrance of the, the hive. Um, there's a, a, another symptom is loss of production and reduced um, brood, brood production. Worker bees can be crawling around the hive with like swollen and greasy looking abdomens. But um, yeah, that's an, it's another one that we don't wanna, um, or we wanna address um, as best as we can. Chalk brood, chalk brood is another um, reportable, notifiable disease. It's a common um, fungal disease, common spread. Um, it can remain viable in wax and honey for several years as well, and it affects the brood stage um, in the life of the colony. But yeah, there's some images there of little mummified um, carcasses here to the right. 
and that's how they get their name chalk brood and you can that's what it looks like when you're looking into the hive uh, European fowl brood it's just another irregular um, well it's it's another concern that's endemic uh, disease throughout Australia at the moment irregular brood patterns with a mixture of capped and uncapped cells you know, we get dead larvae like in twisted positions there's an image there to the just behind me of a of a larvae um, that's been removed from its cell so it can be confused with AFB but it's mostly distinguished um, between the two diseases by doing that that rope test that I just had in the image um, prior when I was showing AFB AFB will rope whereas Euro European won't um, won't be as likely to rope at all but um, yeah, there's other established pests and diseases like sac brood, greater wax moth, brawler fly, which is um, endemic to uh, Victoria now, I believe, and uh, but not not yet New South and black queen cell virus. So there's a big portfolio of of nasties that are there. If you do detect anything here, um, contact the plant um, pest hotline to promote that. Uh, on 1-800-081-881 or you can go to the New South Wales DPI homepage under the Biosecurity Food and Safety tab for reporting the notifiable uh, pests and diseases. I can show you that image uh, now. So this is what it looks like on the DPI website when you get on. You come up here to this Biosecurity Food and Safety um, tab and it's just the one at the top there. Follow the prompts for reporting a, a pest or disease. So that's, that's what we're asking and what we're promoting um, throughout, throughout the state and beyond. And um, I've got another one for a QR code um, for sharing your reporting your washes as well. So that, that's if you want to report your, well, it's, it's recommended you do your 16 week um, reports for your washes. That is a QR code that will take you directly to the link as well to report your washes. But um, yeah, that's me and um, I appreciate all your time and I look forward to getting to know you. That's my story in bees. Uh, I'm really interested in getting to know what your story is. And um, yeah, I hope I, I, um, I serve you well in, in this new role, in this new phase in beekeeping. I never planned to be in this space. I wanted to be out in the field, but um, here I am and it's an absolute privilege to, to be involved in bees. So. Um, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the, the day.